Hi, I'm Joe Berga. A number of visitors to my website after psychotherapy took issue with my earlier post and video about the social network. They felt that the fictional Mark Zuckerberg actually suffers from Asperger's syndrome instead of narcissistic personality disorder. In my view, those two labels from the DSM-4 actually represent two artificially distinct entities. They share a number of features and in truth exist along a spectrum. In this video, instead of trying to demonstrate the features of any particular label, I'd like to discuss two psychological traits that show up in a number of apparently distinct diagnostic entities. And I'll use the main character from that classic film, Citizen Kane, to demonstrate them. The first of these features, a lack of empathy, is a diagnostic criterion of both narcissistic personality disorder and various autistic disorders. The second, narcissistic rage, features in both borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. So, Charles Foster Kane, heir to a Colorado mining fortune. He grows up as the ward of a wealthy financier, and when he comes of age, he decides to run a newspaper because it would be fun. His paper crusades on behalf of the underprivileged, and Charlie views himself as their champion, using his generosity toward the poor as a kind of narcissistic feed. In this first scene, his best friend, Jed Leland, finally tells Charlie the truth about his relationship to the poor. All right. That's the way they want it. The people have made that choice. It's obvious the people prefer Jim Geddes to me. You talk about the people as though you own them, so they belong to you. Goodness. As long as I can remember, you've talked about giving the people their rights, as if you could make them a present of liberty. Charlie exemplifies the kind of narcissism you often see in people who make displays of their compassion and altruism, where the person wants to feel good about himself rather than having true empathy for others. In a similar vein, when Charlie falls in love, he chooses a woman who reflects well upon him and feeds his own idealized self-image. Emily Norton is the niece of a president and an important socialite. Charlie adores her, that is, until her perfect admiration for him begins to wane. In this brilliant montage of scenes, we see their mutual idealization slowly transform into alienation and contempt. You're beautiful. Oh, I can't. Yes, you are. You're very, very beautiful. I've never been to six parties in my life. Extremely beautiful. Whole life. Oh, I'm living the nuts this late. It's a matter of habit. I wonder what the servants will think. They'll think we enjoyed ourselves. Yes. Didn't we? I don't see why you have to go straight after the newspaper. You never should have married a newspaper man. They're worse than sailors. I absolutely adore you. Oh, Charles, even newspaper men have to sleep. I'll call Mr. Bernstein, have him put off my appointments until noon. What time is it? Oh, I don't know, it's late. It's early. Charles, do you know how long you kept me waiting last night while you went to the newspaper for 10 minutes? on a newspaper in the middle of the night. Emily, my dear, your only correspondent is the Inquirer. Sometimes I think I'd prefer a rival of flesh and blood. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. It's what you print, attacking the president. You mean Uncle John? I mean the president of the United States. He's still Uncle John. He's still a well-meaning fathead who's John. letting a pack of high-pressure crooks run his administration. This whole oil scandal. He happens to be the president, Charles. Not you. That's a mistake that will be corrected one of these days. You, Mr. Bernstein, sent Junior the most incredible atrocity yesterday, Charles. I simply can't have it in the nursery. Mr. Bernstein is apt to pay a visit to the nursery now and then. Does he have to? Yes. Really, Charles? People will think... What I tell them to think. Charlie never truly cared about Emily or her feelings. 
any more than he cares about his second wife, Susan Alexander. In the scene when he first meets Susie, he seems most concerned with the fact that she likes him. Later, when he tries to make her an opera star against her own wishes, again, as a narcissistic feed for his grandiose view of himself, he cares nothing about her feelings and proves himself incapable of empathy. She finally attempts suicide in order to escape his relentless narcissistic drive. I couldn't make you see how I felt, Charlie. But I couldn't go through with the singing again. I don't know what it means to know that people are... that a whole audience just doesn't want you. That's when you've got to fight him. All right. You won't have to fight him anymore. It's their loss. Charlie experiences Susan's failure to win over the public as both personal shame and narcissistic injury. He blames the people rather than himself, but he can't empathize at all with his wife's feelings. In order to bolster his narcissistic view of himself, he then builds a monument to Charles Foster Kane, Xanadu, a grandiose castle and the largest private home ever built in America. He fills it with treasures and artworks collected over a lifetime. He and Susie live imprisoned in this castle with little human contact, a perfect symbol for the beautiful, false self the narcissist often erects to disguise the shame he feels about his internal ugliness. Trapped inside this gilded cage, Susie is miserable, she complains with growing shrillness about her unhappiness and the fact that Charlie never gives her anything she actually wants or needs. What's the difference between giving me a bracelet or giving somebody else $100,000 for a statue you're going to keep crated up and never even look at? It's just money. It doesn't mean anything. You never really give me anything that belongs to you that you care about. Susan, I want you to stop this. I'm not going to stop it. Right now. You never gave me anything in your whole life. He just tried to buy me into giving you something. Susan! Whatever I do, I do because I love you. You don't love me. You want me to love you. Sure. I'm Charles Foster Kane. Whatever you want, just name it and it's yours. But you gotta love me. It's clear that Charlie is enraged by her remarks experiencing her very accurate criticism as a narcissistic wound. Shortly afterward, Susie decides to leave him. In the following scene, although she appears to hesitate, her resolve to leave is renewed when he once again shows himself incapable of empathizing with or understanding her feelings. Please don't go. No. Please, Susan. From now on, everything will be exactly the way you want it to be. Not the way I think you want it, but... your way. Hmm? You mustn't go. You can't do this to me. I see you that this is being done to. It's not me at all. For Charlie, a true narcissist of one stripe or another, everything that happens is about him. He is the center of his universe and nobody else's feelings matter. When Susie walks out on him, he explodes with narcissistic rage, as we'll see in the following scene.
As an old man, Jed gives the best summation of Charlie's character and one of the most insightful descriptions of the narcissistic personality you'll ever hear. I suppose he had some private sort of greatness, but he kept it to himself. He never gave himself away. He never gave anything away. He just uh, left your tip. Hmm? <laughs> he had a generous mind. I don't suppose anybody ever had so many opinions. But he never believed in anything except Charlie Kane. He never had a conviction except Charlie Kane in his life. I suppose he died without one. Charles Foster Kane believed in nothing but himself and his self-image. He spent a lifetime craving the narcissistic feed that would give him an inner sense of meaning and value. But in the end, he died a lonely, isolated man. Such is the ultimate fate of all narcissists, because they lack the ability to feel authentic love or empathy, and thereby to form meaningful relationships. Most of what they do is geared toward earning praise and adoration, and when they fail to get it, they may erupt in rage. When he dies, Charlie's final words, Rosebud, imply that nothing has mattered in his life since he was a small child. He developed no personal relationships of any depth. He accomplished nothing that gave him a sense of meaning or purpose. And he dies dreaming wistfully of the sled he owned as a boy. It's a great film. Thanks for watching. Until next time.